Hello, my name is Yvonne Pham. Tonight I'm going to be the facilitator for the discussion about um, this project presentation. I'd like to invite Kitty to introduce herself and talk, um, tell me a little bit about the project. Hi, Yvonne. Thank you for doing this. Um, I am Kitty Pham. I'm the main researcher for this project. It is actually my final thesis for my major um, classics in archaeology, uh, and I will be focusing on the axial age. Thank you so much. So we've got a little quick roadmap here of what I'd like to for us to move through tonight. So we are going to be talking about the axial age, but specifically focusing on the teachers of the axial age. We're going to be looking at the teaching methods and the teaching models that these classical teachers, essentially, have employed throughout um, their tenure, so to speak, specifically focusing on Confucius, the Buddha, Socrates, and from there we're going to delve into a little discussion about how these classical teaching methods can be applied to the modern world. Does that sound good to you? That sounds perfect. Should I explain what the axial age is now? Go ahead. All right. So the axial age was a period in history that revolutionized the methods of thinking about religion and philosophy, which is still current today. This transformation developed during um, throughout the Eurasian continent about 800 to 200 BC, even though these participating cultures had limited contact with one another, the movement would not have been possible without the revolutionary and surprisingly similar teaching methods of the founders um, of their schools of thoughts. So we're going to review three axial age teachers, like you mentioned, Confucius from China, the Buddha in India, Socrates in Greece, and analyze their teaching philosophy and their relevance in reestablishing the foundation of modern education. Okay, so you know what, despite their geographical distance, Confucius, the Buddha, and Socrates emphasized education in a form of a dialogue, open this discussion to people from all walks of life and encourage students to question and participate. In order to achieve their goal, these axio age teachers outline their method of teaching and their expectations on how this information should be disseminated. As a teacher, Confucius promoted dialogue and set the standards of humility and open-mindedness for discussion. Um, I like to point to Analect 7.1, where Confucius asserted that he did not regard himself as a sage because he transmits rather than innovates. Not only did this rejection illustrate his humil humility, but the commitment to transmit ideas also led to his occupation as a teacher and a learner. So I mostly know Confucius as a great Chinese philosopher and his teachings and his thoughts have really influenced the basis of Chinese culture. That being said, how is he a teacher? All right, so, you know, Confucius being a teacher and an exemplar always sought to improve himself and was careful in passing judgment on others. His concern for self-reflection led to his advice that if you come across an inferior person, you turn inwards and examine yourself. This is from um, the Analyx 4.17. This form of empathy and modesty allowed Confucius to conduct a dialogue with diverse opinions, um, which promotes, promotes new perspectives and encourages intellectual conversations based on personal experience, which I think is very re relevant in the modern age. And of I course, agree. yeah, and of course, Confucius would expect the same for his students. So it sounds like as a teacher, he's really trying to teach uh, more so than curriculum, mm -hmm. the basis of wisdom and um, knowledge. I wonder if he was like a little picky about the students that he taught, he, he chose to teach. What are his expectations for his students? That's a great question. Um, and one that's very, very relevant today. And we like to think Confucius is, um, you know, an exclusive teacher, but actually to Confucius, um, the, the most difficult students to teach were those who lack humility. 
Um, Confucius' rule establishes that those who are not eager to learn, I do not explain anything, and to those who are bursting to speak, I do not reveal anything. If I raise one angle and they do not come back with the other three angles, I will not repeat myself. This is from um, the Analect 7.8. Um, uh, and I like to point out that even though he, like we think he, was, he must have been a very exclusive teacher, he demands only this much of his students that they engage in dialogue. Uh, and his relationship with students exemplified one of the most important learning experiences in the axial age which is discussion. Discussions can be an excellent strategy for enhancing interest in the subject, fostering new knowledge and questioning old ones, regardless of who you're talking to. They create opportunities for students to practice and sharpen a number of skills, including the articulation of one's position, the consideration for different points of views, and the evaluation of one's own version of truth. Now, in return as a teacher, Confucius would illustrate his openness to being corrected and taught by others. This is such an excellent idea, and I hope it's more, uh, it's passed down more in the modern education system. Mm -hmm. In this regard, you know, we're having a discussion too about right. learning. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, you to elaborate more on what a true learner is like within um, Confucius's definition, because it seems here he has a very strong opinion on how a student should behave. Right. Um, so why discussion provide an avenue for developing developing knowledge? Leading a discussion can be daunting and can make students lose interest if Confucius was not open-minded. So it's almost like a two-way street. And by their nature, I think discussions are unpredictable and require Confucius to surrender a certain degree of control over the, the flow of information. Um, and in this sense, a true learner or a teacher is a humble one. Might as well be the same thing, a learner and a teacher. And who knows, he knows that he can never possess all knowledge. Confucius teaches that when you know a thing, to recognize that you know it, and when you do not, to know that you do not know. That is knowledge from the Analects um, 2.15. Um, a true scholar never stops pursuing knowledge and has enough humility to be corrected and seek out more ideas that he has yet to discover. Oh, so this is kind of like how um, when in a river, rocks that constantly cause friction against each other will become smooth and polished over time. That's over um, exposure and um, contact of all sorts of different cultures and viewpoints. In this mm -hmm. sense, an open discussion really helps with learning. What did those look like in a Confucius classroom? Right. Uh, first of all, I thought your um yeah, what you compared right there was very poetic. <laughs> it's a very poetic image. Uh, and to your question, um, Confucius' participation in the dialectic practice illustrates his uh, emphasis on learning as a means to foster critical thinking and building knowledge. These particular concepts are vital to Confucius' teaching as well, I mean, as portrayed in his warning. And he says in Analect um, 2.15, if you learn without thinking about what you have learned, you will be lost. If you think without learning, however, you will fall into danger. Hence, um, he thinks the importance of discussion. And Confucius considered the latter, which is think without learning, um, to be more dangerous. But both problems uh, pose a threat to society. When a student learns without thinking, he might make the same mistake and waste his time learning. But in a position of power, this educated person can pursue dangerous paths for a state, which otherwise could have been avoided. And, you know, the state is a, a major concern for Confucius. And, and, you know, secondly, if a person thinks, when a person thinks without learning, he might commit improper actions altogether. The exercise of discussion encourages learning and a humble spirit promotes acceptance of one's mistakes and willingness to learn from others. Furthermore, Confucius disapproved of memorization and encouraged actual learning. Um, and he says in um, 13.5, imagine a person who can recite 300 odes, which is an important um, Chinese book uh, by heart, but when delegated a governmental task is unable to carry it out, no matter how many odes he, um, he might have memorized, what good are they to him? You know, and, and I just thought, 
this is such an important point in modern education um, in Asia as well as in um, in the Western world as well. And mindlessly resigning information runs parallel, but I think never intersects to the actual understanding of one's lesson. Uh, Confucius discouraged memorization when the meaning has not been comprehended well enough to be useful to one's knowledge. This is all a very, very beautiful illustration of how critical thinking and critical thinking in classrooms should work. It is very interesting, however, that he has to make that comparison in a governmental sense. What would you think is the effect of this kind of critical thinking? Confucius's classroom in this time, its effect on the politics mm -hmm. and public policy. I think, um for a teacher to assert their contribution, um, his or her contribution to the spiritual and practical world, he must organize a target audience and a teaching plan that he thinks would represent his philosophy most effectively. Um, and Confucius believed that the key to a harmonious state lies in good government. And you know, during the time that he was living in, it was extremely unstable. And, but con and that's why Confucius was concerned with this. And he believes that good government is depending, dependent upon the goodness and morality of the ruler. He often traveled um, beyond the state of Lu, where he's from, to educate the rulers about the wisdom of his moral vision. It's not always um, received well, <laughs> uh, oh. but of course, more later on. But to Confucius, education is a significant medium that takes an imperfect human being closer to perfection and a meaningful existence, and the effect would trickle down to those below the hierarchy. He advised the rulers to win the trust of the people and set an example. And so he says in the Analects 13.6, um, when a ruler is correct, his will is put into effect without the need for official order. So without the enforcement of rules, the virtuous ruler's ruler affects the state of his kingdom by being a moral person. And that has a trickle-down effect. Uh, Confucius recommended the rulers to guide their subjects by edicts, keeping keep them in line with punishments, and they will reform themselves. That's in the Analect, um, Analect 2.3. Just like the ruler to his subjects, Confucius himself set an example for his students by being constantly engaged in learning and studying the chronicles of early periods, which he considers to be an ideal state. He spent a prodigious amount of time studying the documents and chronicles of early periods, like books on rituals, the Yijing, and the Book of Odes. The study of ancient texts can be applied to one's own life, provide the moral lessons, and encourage learning through discussion, which I think we can make a point later on um, with the modern application of classical learning. And Confucius transmitted these ideas, this ancient text, because the ancient embodies the good, and the memory of this good has been preserved in records that embody the saving truth. He believed that they can provide guidance in a chaotic society to return to an ideal state. It's very interesting that you mentioned that he had a sort of target audience for his teaching, and he had very strong expressions and opinions on the goodness of society, and specifically the goodness of society through transforming public policy. Mm -hmm. Did this mean, however, that his teachings were only for the elites who were going to lead? Right, that's an interesting question. I think we're going back to the first point where we, we tend to think he must have been very famous back then, back then, he must have been an exclusive teacher. But in reality, the Analects paints a picture of a teacher who would accept any student. Confucius has said that he would never deny an instruction from anyone who offered as little as a bundle of silk or a bit of cured meat. This goes to say that the student's devotion for the love of learning was sufficient for Confucius to accept them as his disciples. His goal extended beyond the desire for financial wealth or stately influence, which I think is an important point. He needed those who wished to contribute to scholarly pursuits and sought social goodness and accountability for that goodness all throughout. The direction of more charisma does not move only from the top down, although it sounds like that from the trickle-down effect. Um, that he mentions before. To practice moral cultivation, however, um, Confucius proposed that in education, there is no differences in kind. 
um, and that's in the NLX 15.38. He advocated a, for a type of open education for all people, regardless of their socioeconomic classes, as long as they're interested. Even commoners could contribute to the welfare of society by cultivating virtue. Um, and Confucius taught himself that by simply by being a good son and friendly to his brothers, a man can exert influence upon government in the NLX um, 2.21. Even though Confucius believed in the trickle-down effect of good rule, he urged for a strong foundation of society in order to provide the necessary moral fabric for an ideal state. If these were things that Confucius taught the heads of state, he told them that they, the social superiors, could be morally influenced or even taught by their subordinates. Likely a historical um, a uh, historically radical idea, but in order to be a harmonious community, members of society must actively participate in this more pursue and learning process, which in turn creates a strong society ruled by head of state, who by the advice of the subordinates and the behavior of the people will be accountable to act similarly. And I think this resonates with not just, um, you know, Eastern teaching, but also in the West as well. And though Confucius did not suggest something like a social contract, like from, you know, John Locke much later, the system of a trickle-down effect um, needs people like him to help implement these ideal behaviors and keep the ruler accountable to his people. In this philosophy combined with Confucius' um, generosity to teach others, everyone has the potential to be a learner. Um, the notion that commoners, like Confucius, who just by the virtue of their knowledge and wisdom, may teach the elites on how to rule with moral authority gave the axial age a new dimension in that knowledge is not esoteric and exclusive to the men from the top. It's so interesting because it's almost as if Confucius had wanted to better society through teachings and through education and the, the, the spreading of um, knowledge and, and wisdom, which is a kind of like a theme that we sort of see being reiterated in the current modern world. Right. But in this case, it's almost like, not so much a trickle down effect if you think about it, but more mm -hmm. so like a water cycle. It goes back oh. and forth. Now, I want to move on to another large figure in this movement, the Buddha. So the Buddha emerged in ancient India as one of the Axial Age thinkers. He began spreading his knowledge and eventually established the Sanghas, or a community of monks. The Buddha customized his teaching style to his disciple and advocated for critical thinking as well. Can you tell me what you know about this? Right, that is um, a great person to um, like to move on from. And he's in many ways like Confucius, the Buddha, also garner um, the emotional intelligence to address the audience in ways that um, that would suit the current temperament. And the, you know the story of the mustard seed. Uh, there's a I love this story because. It reveals a lot about um, how the Buddha and how other teachers should, you know, reflect upon the temperament of the student and teach in that manner. In the story of the master seed, a desperate woman who seeks the medicine to bring her son back to life approaches the Buddha. The Buddha tells her to go get some mustard seeds from a household that has not been touched by death. Uh, and recognizing that she seems to be unprepared to process his learning and teaching, his, he sends her on a mission to discover the impermanence of life. Only when she re realizes that everyone experiences death, that he reviews his wisdom. However, despite his influence and strong ability to instruct, the Buddha never expected his teachings to be accepted because of his authority. He encouraged the free inquiry and allowed the questioning of dogma at the time. So it sounds like unlike Confucius, Buddha was the Buddha was more indirect with his teaching style. Mm. He more so, it felt like he sent his students out on a life journey to discover these answers themselves. So it brings me to the question if was there ever a time where he wouldn't answer a student's question? Well, I think you just asked a very fascinating question that we don't see a lot in different texts um, regarding discussions. Uh, the Buddha permitted himself to be challenged as a form of learning and not as undermining his authority. He urged that 
the individuals take responsibility for their own education and conviction. To do so, the followers must be able to criticize in order to improve their own point of view. For instance, the Buddha remained silent when Vachaglata, the wanderer, asked him if there is a concept of Atman or the self. And let me read you um, the story here. So as he was sitting, he, um, Vachaglata asked the blessed one, who's the Buddha, now then, Master Gotama, who's the Buddha, is there a self? And when this was said, the blessed one was silent. Uh, then there is no self, um, Vajagata asked. The second time, the blessed, the blessed one was silent. And the Vajagata, the wanderer, got up from his seat and left. Then not long after the Vajagata and the wanderer had left, Venerable An Ananda said to the blessed one, the Buddha, why, Lord, did the blessed one not answer when asked the question by Vajagata? And Ananda, uh, the Buddha, said, if I, being asked by Vajagata, the wonder if there is a self, were to answer that there is a self, that would be conforming with those who, those contemplatives and Brahmins who are exponents of eternalism. If I, being asked by Vajagata, if there is no self, were to answer that there is no self, <laughs> that would be conforming with those contemplatives and Brahmins who are exponents of Annihilationism. Um, this is from the Ananda Sutta. So instead of answering, the Buddha internalized the question and contemplated in silence. If he were to answer, the disciple does not have to think, and he would not have made his he would have made his response the authoritative stance. The Buddha encouraged his followers to subject their beliefs and ideas to rigorous questioning especially the dogmas on the basis of authority and antiquity, allowing his follower, followers to accept his ideas without questioning them would, help, would have felt in a, insufficient to him because learning should not just be based on the recitation of the leader saying. And again, this is important in the modern day as well that we you know, do the research, we think about it and you know, not just question because somebody asks us to question it because it comes naturally and we are curious about it and we don't demand authoritative answers. This is especially true and I agree with this. And in this way, it is almost said that you can find just as many viewpoints and, um, and many other different answers from being introspective rather than being ex extrospective, if you think about it that way. Mm -hmm. and so it makes me wonder, is the reason for this question not just a challenge? Could it be used to clarify and to expose more points of views? Because if, if we go back in the presentation a little bit, or what you said, mm -hmm. if you consistently say that those who are not eager to learn, I do not explain anything, and those who are bursting to speak, I do not reveal anything, if I raise one angle and they do not come back with three other angles, I will not um, repeat myself. Right, and that's a really good reflection um, and, a, and a connection there. A successful discourse relies on both the student's and teacher's understanding of their temperament. I think like a sort of emotional intelligence. Self-awareness, self right? Right, right, yeah. And both the Buddha and Confucius desire their students to be engaging in the thought process and those who did not demand a simple answer from their teachers. You know, and this is honestly, this is so relevant in modern day classrooms where, you know, we have the technology and we're distracted and we have, to be honest, a shorter attention span and we're not, exactly engaging with the teachers um as much as like that, that as much as it used to be demanded <laughs> the and the buddha also does not did not discriminate against those um whose principles oppose his as he said to um as he's referring to the brahmins and the wanderers too uh, of other sects too i teach dhamma the truth because if they were to understand even a single sentence, that would be a happiness and a blessing for them for a long time. He extended, extended his knowledge to everyone who wished to challenge him. The Buddha facilitated discussions in a way that conversationalists do not demand an answer, but collaborate to get to the closer truth and understanding no matter who they are. The Buddha sought intellectual discourse for others and was dissatisfied with the truth without debate. 
So it sounds like a day in the classroom of the Buddha would be a very robust one as you're relying on your own introspectiveness to critically analyze and think and dissect before you can finally reach a version of the truth that can be tested and upheld. Right. I think then, is there any such, is there any such thing as a non-robust um, discussion, unsatisfactory discussion in, um, in the eyes of the Buddha? Right, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and besides the fact that students need to, you know, engage with the teacher and be interested um, in the subject and do research on it, the Buddha um, also advised against questions that get in the way of intellectual advancement. Mm -hmm. um, the venerable, and I hope I say his name right, Malukya Puta asked the Buddha four questions about the universe, which the Buddha remained silent. Um, and he went as far, and Malunka Kyabuta went as far as saying that he would renounce his belief, but the Buddha still would not speak. In explaining why he remained unresponsive to the four questions, the Buddha used the parable of the poisoned arrow. Um, and it, it's, it tells the story of a person wounded who refused to have the arrow removed until he knew who shot it, whether it was a common arrow, a curved arrow, a barbed, a calf toothed, or an oleander arrow. The man would die and those things would still remain unknown to him. The Buddha <laughs> advised his disciples not to waste time, not to waste their time and energy in metal physical speculation. Whenever he was asked a metaphysical question, he remained silent. Instead, he directed his disciples toward practical knowledge that relates to the Four Noble Truths to relieve suffering and gain salvation, a very relevant point um, at that point in time. Indeed it is, because it sounds like um, one of the main goals of the Buddha's guidance at that time was to guide all his disciples and students towards their understanding of truth. Now, speaking of truth, the Buddha did find, um, did reach um, enlightenment, find his method of truth, and he did attain nirvana. But mm -hmm. I'm very curious why he didn't just evaporate or ascend to um, a higher spiritual plane? And why did he stay back on earth for an extended amount of time? Yeah, I think this is a, a really great observation. And it leads to the point why he decided to be a teacher. So, you know, at the moment the Buddha reached enlightenment, the demon Mara tempted him to leave everyone behind. Yet the Buddha still noticed those who can be receptive to his teaching and those who almost reach nirvana. On the basis of that belief, he did not evaporate to nirvana, but returned to be a teacher. He realized that he would have left the world to the same problems that he tried to overcome, which I think is a very important point here. The Buddha commissioned the first members of the Sangha, the monastic community, for the welfare of the many, out of compassion for the world, and for the good of gods and men. And this is in Vinaya, Vinaya Pitaka. Um, the Buddha told his followers to teach in the language of their listeners as well, in contrast with the Brahmins, who still taught the esoteric knowledge of their religion in Sanskrit, a language only understood by the high castes. The Buddha knew that for people to be able to converse in dialogue and be engaged, they had to take the role of a speaker and listener, depending on the, the situation. Again, this goes back to um, about his point, the welfare of the many. Um, for this reason, the Buddha and his followers found a receptive audience among many of the inhabitants of the burgeoning cities at the time when so many of the traditional political traditional political um, social and economic institutions were challenged the buddha's message that there's nothing um nothing permanent everlasting unchanging and eternal in the whole world exists in, in the whole existence appeal to the senses of the common people if you think about it furthermore if with populations increasingly concentrating in urban areas, the suffering and frustrations that the Buddha spoke of were probably more um, and more evident to the city dwellers. The Buddha's emphasis on spiritual community appealed to the masses due to the visibility of suffering everywhere in the ancient world. This led to the desire of the common people to lessen their grief and permanently break free from the natural decay associated with sickness and old age. His teachings, if you notice this, have 
a therapeutic effect, not just intellectual. So we see a theme here about how knowledge and wisdom can be used to better the society like as a whole. And mm -hmm. in the case of teaching, it provides a sort of like emotional comfort to the very many masses. We begin to see this whole um, theme of that those who are endowed with the wisdom should use it to better the rest of society as a whole. Right. Right. This is how we all just get better. Now, that being said, the common people having access to the Buddha's teaching could reach nirvana, or is it just limited to the Sangha? Right. Um, this is a great theological question here. The Buddha's openness um, to all was inspired by his convic conviction that nirvana was not limited by caste or by the status of the monk. And as many believed at the time, awakening was possible for everyone. The Buddha and his disciples refused to discriminate as they spread their ideas to people from all walks of life. Men, women, children, aristocratic and peasants, rich and poor, ascetics and priests, high castes and um, low castes. Productive, meaningful dialogue can help them to contribute significantly to the awareness and development of important truths. Five years after the founding of the Sangha, this might be interesting, the monastic community and the Sangha, women were admitted as ordained members of the order. The Buddha's consent to accept women into the Sangha, though he was reluctant at the time, um, was a radical step for, um, at that moment. Many believed that women, like the uneducated lower caste of India, simply did not have the necessary intellectual abilities and were too vain to achieve enlightenment. In the story of the mustard seed, when Kisa Gotami, um, the woman with the, the dead child, returns uh, to the Buddha in a wiser mood, the Buddha finally speaks a few words to her. Um, upon hearing this, Kisa Gotami fully realizes the imperm impermanence of life. And this is important because it, it demonstrates that she possesses the intellectual capacity to be enlightened, making her, like other women with the same degree of learning, a worthy disciple of the Buddha. In his lifetime, the Buddha set a good model as a teacher and expressed thoughtful concern for the society that he lived in. That's, again, a very beautiful um, ending to that story. It's like we've come full circle that mm -hmm. she finally finished her life journey. She comes back and she's learn from that lesson and in a way she's opened her mind yeah. to the truth of the world and that's not a great teacher I don't know what is <laughs> but we're gonna move on from that because thinking of another good model I'd like to shift our attention to Socrates from Greece Greece, which is known as the cradle of the West, emerged as the intellectual power of its time and contributed to the axial age. From then on, philosophers of Greece questioned traditional ideas and practiced rhetorical strategies, also known as discussions, to help them reach the truth. Socrates, an infamous philosopher during this movement, engaged in a dialogue of questioning and answering, mm -hmm. which you know later developed into the Socratic method. Right. Can you analyze an instance of this teaching method? Right. Um, so though he had many pupils and was considered to, by many, even to this day, to be an influential teacher, he did not promise to teach them anything and has not done so. And we will get back to that point. Um, at the same time, he did not write anything down, but most of his style uh, was recorded by his student Plato in The Republic and The Apology. The Republic is a Socratic method, I mean Socratic dialogue, between Socrates and his friends who argue about justice, order, and virtue. Um, and I'm going to tell you um, an excerpt from there right now. Uh, he and his friends begin discussing the nature of justice, which reviews I think reviews Socrates' methodology. Socrates says to Thrasymachus, um, his another debater, um, justice, as you say, is the intent. I'm sorry, the interest of the stronger. What Thrasymachus is the meaning of this? You cannot say that because the Pancratus is stronger than we are and finds the eating of beef conducive to his bodily strength, that to eat beef is therefore equally 
for our good, who are weaker than he is, is and right and just for us. And Nasimaka says, well, that's abominable of you. Oh, you take no. <laughs> yeah, You take the words in the sense which is most dangerous to um, damaging to the argument. And Socrates replies, not at all, my good sir. I'm trying to understand them. And I wish that you would be a little clearer. And Nasimachus explains to him again. And Socrates says, okay, now I understand you. And whether you are right or not, I will try to discover. And there's more questioning and answering that follows this. So you can see here that this conversation reveals the Socratic method introduced by Socrates, as recorded by Plato. This method works in the form of questions and answers in order to reach the ultimate truth. Questioning directs one to get to the truth and helps the debaters to find the path to the answer. Socrates' questioning demonstrates how thorough one can inspect others' ideas through eliminating previous hypotheses and identifying one without contradictions, at least to um, his points. Uh, his teaching method also led to the scrutiny of commonly held beliefs similar to the Buddha. Uh, he would not accept them until he can test their consistency and logic against others. So it sounds here that Socrates knew what he was doing by questioning his um, students' beliefs and statements. Um, and in, in that sense, it's a very different teaching style from Confucius, who just facilitates discussion, and um, the Buddha, who kind of sends you out on an introspective limb. Mm. What does he say, or what does he claim that he does not teach? What does this mean? Right, and I think we, we've been seeing this theme <laughs> all around with the teacher saying, oh, I don't, I'm not teaching, I'm just a transmitter. Uh, and get, like, and that, that's from Confucius. And, you know, for Socrates, uh, his interest is in discovering the truth, not in convincing others that he should be believed and followed. This explains his claim in, in court, and this is a court case in 399 BC, um, where he was, you know, accused of, many things. And he said in the court trial that he's never been anyone's teacher and never promised to teach anything and have not done so. But like Confucius, who was willing to speak to any student who could give him a different perspective in the discussion, Socrates was equally ready to question the rich and the poor if anyone is willing to answer his questions and listen to what he says. Unlike Confucius, who believed in taking part in the government, in government rule, Socrates disliked that idea because a man who really fights for justice must lead a private, not public life. Socrates' method of, uh, method of dialogue became influential um, in later times, including now, especially through the context of um, Plato. Plato and others would use Socrates as a context for their teaching and regard themselves as his students, despite, um, despite Socrates' claim otherwise. There seems to be truth to a statement that once a student, always a student, despite your role in um, education, just, just despite your role in um, general, we begin to see this common theme across all the great teachers where they're never really considering themselves as a great almighty bearer and transmitter of right. knowledge. Never really their um, intention. They're very humble about right. it. Right. Um, you know, Socrates based much of his teaching um, on leading people to question things that they thought they knew. And Socrates was known to have vast knowledge in logical reasoning and reading. According to Plato and the Apology, Socrates heard that the priestess at Delphi told his friends that God said Socrates is the wisest man on earth. And instead of accepting God's word, he tested God's answer and um, by talking to other people from different fields. And he discovered that the expertise in one field does not warrant intellect in all other matters. A man who is wise will be prepared to accept his own ignorance rather than pretending to know what he does not. As a matter of fact, even though Socrates was a teacher, he often claimed to know nothing, and he said there's no such thing as teaching, only recollection. His method laid the engagement um, of questioning and logical answers to reach the final truth. In this sense, I feel like I've become a lot smarter. From <laughs> okay, <hearing good. laughs> just from this presentation alone, imagine if one of us could have been in 
one of the classical classrooms in which um, in any of in, in any of the teachers we had right. just discussed. And you know, I find it very interesting that these teachers all had different teaching styles. They came from different backgrounds, but they happened to come to this almost very similar conclusion of mm -hmm. the way of teaching you know and if, if you if you think about it if you think about it it's based on discussion it's based on an opening of perspective and it's also based on the welfare of the common people and also just the humility aspect of it right. as well you know how can this be applied to modern education you know, and I like to reflect on what I think um, modern education is like. And I think, you know, I think modern education these days is almost consumer based, kind of like a customer service model. Um, and I felt in that way, even though they're saying, you know, we should learn and for the sake of, you know, passing the knowledge to others, I think the deeper issues are lost. And it's you know it's not just about our own knowledge but it's also about the community around us and i felt even though that's being promoted in education i don't see um my, in my own opinion i don't see the the true you know engagement in the community um rather than you know just to get like to have a mean to an end i mean a sort of community service um, that's promoted these days. And to me, classical education is a foundation for the self. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't have to focus on making a living in the world. It's not an elite, uh, to find a foundation for the self is not an elitist concept. And, you know, to, you know, find a job as well as to have a balance of your foundation. And, and it's not, mutually exclusive you can do both and be responsible for your um, education and conviction and it's important to talk about the balance here because depth of um, learning is not aimed as an economic goal and again it's not mutually exclusive it, not because you go search for a classical education that is useless um, for your economic pursuit is not at all um, mutually exclusive <laughs> like i keep saying that very interesting very very interesting i just kind of also feel that this is also a point that is being missed in a lot of uh, modern education systems as unfortunately there becomes this emphasis results rather than the journey which is what classical education does emphasize and to that regard i have to thank you for teaching yeah. me so much today i learned so much and it was an honor to um hear you speak do you have any final words kitty well uh, i mean i just want to thank you for um you know commenting on what i said and i you know i learned a lot and i love all of your comparisons and I, I think in in the form of discussion and i know this is a podcast and i do a lot of talking here but I really appreciate that you comment on um, what I what I was saying. I think it's a great form of dialogue that's, you know, missing a lot in in the classroom. And I wonder how this could have an impact, especially in the you know, um, in you know, we're in twenty twenty right now. For um, any viewers who isn't sure, we're in like the coronavirus crisis right now, and everything is virtual. And I'm wondering, you know, how dialogue could be approached in that way versus in like an actual classroom. It's going to be a case study for the ages. Mark my <laughs> words. But we're right. going, we're going to be around there. We're hopefully, hopefully, now that we have this knowledge that you've imparted to the two of us, we can change it. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you for um, your cooperation, Kitty. This has been a marvelous experience. Good night. We are set. And hopefully you'll be able to join us next time for another deep discussion. Well, thank Have you so much. Have a good yeah. day. <laughs> you too.